Welcome back. Richard, this week we are going to, um, we're going to talk about emotions and feelings. Very and, much on our mind these days. Absolutely. And, you know, when we were first talking about this idea, this, this, this topic, um, you know, I kept thinking, man, we, we, we talked about this before. I know that we've talked about some of these things before. And um, we did, in fact. But yeah. uh, about four years ago, it was in June of 2017. And that was back when we had our different intro music. And uh, there was a lot different about the podcast back then. So, uh, but it is time to, to visit this topic again and, and talk a little bit more about these issues. Well, you know, there, there are a couple of things that produced, that elicited this, uh, this uh, desire to talk about emotions again. One is that you and I were asked to write a book chapter about right. emotional disorders in children. And so we've been writing about it, talking about it, thinking about it over the past few months. And the other thing is that is this is uh, with the pandemic, it's a highly emotional time and people are, um, there's a lot of grieving going on, not only for the over 500,000 citizens, the people we've lost, but just the, the um, grieving over the, the lives, the life that each of us had that is now gone. Um, and so we're trying to get used to a new reality. And so many of us are, going, are, are grieving the loss of, of um, everything, everything as simple as going out to dinner when we want to, um, to having to wear masks and having to change our lives. And so there's a, there's a lot of emotions that have been stirred up. So we thought it might be a good idea to revisit this topic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, um, you know, just when you think it, it's a, uh, it's an easy topic to discuss when you think it's, you know, oh, it's just everybody experiences emotions, everybody experiences these feelings and everything. So we'll just, it'll be pretty straightforward. Um, right. you, you realize that it's not. Um, and, it, and in fact, in the show notes, um, we're, I, I'm working really hard. I'm still, I'm already working on them, uh, trying to host uh, just a variety of resources that you can go mm -hmm. to to learn more about feelings and emotions. Um, and, you know, the, uh, we'll, hopefully all of those links will be, will be up, but we'll, we'll see what happens about right. that. But no, it, it isn't, you know, you, you, you start writing about this topic as we did with the chapter, or you, you sort of organize your thinking and try to make an outline and say, okay, let's start somewhere simple. You know, like, what are emotions or, well, wait a minute, what about are emotions and feelings the same thing? Turns out nothing is simple. You start to read the, th the theories and not, there isn't anything simple about this topic. It's an extraordinarily complex topic that's been talked about for literally for thousands of years. And, um, it, and it's, um, it's funny, the conclusion that some theorists have reached. You know, it's just about throwing your hands up and saying, oh, we don't know, you know, we don't, right. we don't know what to make of it. Because this, the simplest question that I started with was our emotions and feelings the same thing? Right. And um, so there's this whole group of, I guess we would call them theorists who say, no, they're different. Uh, emotions and feelings are different. And there's another whole group that says, no, they're the same thing. It's actually just two, two different names for the same thing. Right. For the people who say they're different, and I kind of like this distinction, yeah. they say feelings are physical. Right. And so you can feel things with your fingers, you can feel pain, you can feel temperature. So you can feel physical sensations, but you also feel, you also feel um, thoughts and feelings and you know, there's this other thing that we feel. Right, there is a, there is a physi physiological stimulation that comes from these things that we're calling emotions. Right. And thoughts right. and ideas and responses, react, you know, physiological reactions to things happening. I mean, when you are, when you walk around the corner and there's a snake, right. you feel that in your body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there, nothing has happened to you. Right. Um, nothing has uh, impacted you physically, mm -hmm. unless a snake bit you or something, but um, nothing has affected you physically, but you can feel fear. That's right. And you wake up some days and you just feel kind of blah, you know, not, nothing has happened. You haven't been affected by anything from the external environment. 
you just have this feeling of, oh, I don't feel like getting out of bed. You just blah. Other days you wake up and you say, okay, let's get going. Okay. Right. And it's not because of what you're doing. You know, you do the same thing every day, but some days you just feel differently. And so we have, we feel things physically or we see things, we hear things, but we also have these other inner feelings. Okay. Right. And, and we're responding to all those things all the time. Okay. Right. Whether it's an internal feeling or something from the outside, like seeing a snake. Okay. So, so how do you, what do you make of these things? So some people say, well, feelings are this physical the right. sensation that you get, whereas emotions are a more of a mental process. Okay. And that's, that's sort of what we want to talk about. Um, so it, the APA dictionary <laughs> defines it. At, and I thought, okay, let's go APA. Let's get this thing settled. Right. And their, their definition is that even uh, feeling is a conscious subjective experience of emotions. So that, that, <laughs> that didn't clarify it for me. I mean, not much, not much. No, it's, um, I, I think I get it, what they're saying. And, you know, th those people, wh whether it's the individuals who say that feelings and emotions are different, uh, or those that are saying that feelings and emotions are the same, or even this, um, very uh, clear definition from APA. Um, what they're saying is that feelings and emotions happen simultaneously. Right. Now, now right. there are theorists who say that um, that you actually have the emotion first, and then you you experience a feeling based upon whatever emotion it is that you you are experiencing. Um, and then there are some who say that you have a physiological feeling, and then you assign <laughs> an emotion. To that feeling right um but even they are saying that this happens at a like in a nanosecond like right. it, it happens so fast that, that it's not really a it's not really discernible as to which mm -hmm. happens first it's just the way right. to think about it that's right it, is it something that happens in a sequence you know first you have feelings and then emotions well no you first have emotions then you have feelings so do they happen in a sequence or do they happen simultaneously? So anyway, we can't reach consensus. Okay, the bottom line is we can't reach consensus. Um, but, but we wanna come back to this distinction because it's going to be helpful later when we talk about emotions in a clinical setting. Okay, this is, we're talking about emotions theoretically right now, but when we move down, uh, the, when we get into the uh, deeper into this uh, podcast, we're gonna talk about emotions from a clinical perspective, and then this distinction becomes important again. So, so we, we ran into this article in Psychologia. Yeah. The author finally says, he, he talks about this, are they different or are they the same? He said, forget it. There's no consensus on the difference between feelings and emotions. And if there is one, it's still okay to use the terms interchangeably because that's what most people do. Right. So let's forget about this theoretical argument. Let's just, most of us talk about feelings and emotions being the same thing. Okay. So what are emotions? Well, for us, I, I, I think I speak for both of us here, Bernie. Um, yeah. we, we often take an evolutionary perspective right. on these sorts of things. Um, and that means that we, um, we, we base this whole thing on brain function. Right. All right. And most of you know that um, the brain is not a unitary structure. It's not a single structure like a liver. A liver is a, is a unitary structure, a kidney. Uh, even the heart is a single muscle, okay? It, it, and it has a single, essentially a single function. In, in contrast to those kinds of organs, the brain is much more complex. And we actually have five brains. Um, the, the simplest being the brain stem. And then there are these uh, four brains stacked on top of that. Right. And it ends with the wrinkled part of the brain that we call the cortex. And each of those five regions performs a essentially performs a different function. Okay? Right. So the brain stem takes care of automatic things like breathing and heart rate and respiration, those sorts of things that we don't have conscious control of. Okay. Um, we can That's skip good. sections, the, the second and third brains, because while they contribute stuff, it's just good. we don't really need to discuss those too much. But that gets us to the fourth brain. And, and the fourth brain houses the limbic system. Yeah. And that, that's, really, that's really the important, um, the, the first of two very important 
functions when it comes to handling emotions. Right. Yeah. The the limbic system is is sometimes referred to as the reptilian brain. Right. It's it's really just reactive. It is um, it's memory. It um, it's almost hedonistic. It's like meeting your basic survival needs um, right. and whatever those survival needs may be, whether it's eating or protecting or reproducing or, or whatever the case may be. It is, mm -hmm. it is pure um, survival and emotion. That's right. It's a, the word we say limbic system. It was named over a hundred years ago. Uh, the word limbus uh, not to be confused with Nimbus. Wasn't that the Nimbus from Harry Potter? The uh, broom? One of his um, broomsticks had the Nimbus, was the, the Nimbus 2000. Nimbus 2000. Well, this is the lim this is Limbus. Um, limbus means ring, okay? Uh, so it's a, it's a circle of structures um, in the, in, right underneath the wrinkled part of our brain. And it consists of a, of a group of structures, each of which is responsible for reacting to the environment. Okay, we say creating emotions, but what it's actually doing is these very highly specialized structures are reacting to environmental events. So right. if we go back to the snake, um, it's the it's one of those structures understands that that animal is dangerous, and so it creates an emotional response. Okay, it, it, um, it does that. Pre-conscious. So we're, yeah. remember, you know, as we look at these layers, mm -hmm. um, at, from the brainstem all the way up to the limbic system, uh, before you get to the cortex, all of that happens really outside of our conscious decision. That's right. That's right. Uh, most of it, and, and it's not mm -hmm. until the cortex becomes really fully developed that you gain some control over some of those structures. Um, you know, athletes can, you know, even do various activities and you know, well, I guess anybody can, but activity, um, athletes are really good at being able to control their heart rate. For example, you know, they can mm -hmm. slow themselves, slow their respirations and their heart rates down to, to, to help them, um, perform. But, um, right. in terms of the limbic system, a lot of these reactions and a lot of these emotions, um, come about, um, without conscious decision. You know, That's you're right. away from the snake before you even really consciously are aware that there's a snake there. That's right. And there's a very good reason for that. You know, the, 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 but you're right. In the first four brains, everything is happening. It's like an obligatory response. It just occurs. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And that's important to remember because later on, we're going to say, if you experience the emotion, experience it. It's there for some reason. Your brain, your body is reacting to something. And it's your job to figure out what is it, what, what's going on, and what, how should I react to it, okay? And so, but, it, but up to that point, the, by the time, until we get to the cortex, everything is, um, is unconscious and automatic, okay? So then we get to the last area of the brain, which is the cortex, and that's the part of the brain that we use for thinking, for reading, um, doing math problems. We also use that for inhibiting our emotions right. because if we didn't have the cortex, our emotions would just come out as, as, as very intense reactions. Right, and, but perhaps what we should say instead of inhibit emotions, it inhibits our reaction to our emotions or the, right. the behaviors that we engage in as a response to our emotions. Right, because the the limbic system might produce anger right but the but the top of the brain said wait a minute <laughs> be, be careful what you do with that anger because right. it could get you into trouble and the part of the brain that does that doesn't mature fully until you're in your mid-20s right. so if you think of a teenager who's perfectly capable of producing emotions but doesn't have the control yet because it's a it doesn't it's not mature yet doesn't have the, the ability to control those emotions. And so they, they tend to act out, okay? They tend to act impulsively. And that's normal for kids with, um, normal for teenagers. They have very big emotions, not a lot of inhibition. Right. But it's this dynamic tension between the emotions that are produced in the limbic system and the ability of the cortex to direct those emotions and to 
understand and interpret and direct them into some type of socially appropriate action. Right. Yeah. And so it, it, and it works through, you know, the, the system is, well, the system is fascinating. And you and I talk about, have mm. talked about how this entire system works many times um, in, in workshops and, and even on the podcast, we've talked about this, uh, the way that, you know, all of our sensory information goes into our, a, a little structure called the thalamus. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the thalamus in, in, in some ways sort of makes decisions on its own. Um, when, when, when visual information goes into the thalamus and the thalamus interprets whatever it, that stimulus is as a snake, right. it immediately sends information to the limbic system that says, get, get, get to safety, get away. Mm -hmm. Right. And it does that before it sends it to the visual cortex for you to be able to process that you see a snake. Right. So, That's right. You know, because of the way the thalamus works to keep us safe, to keep us mm -hmm. protected, um, it sort of filters everything first to save those. Again, we're talking about like nanoseconds mm -hmm. to save those nanoseconds to make sure that we get to safety um, rather than you know, going through the process of, of trying to understand what it is that we're seeing or hearing or smelling or right. whatever um, to, to get then get to safety. That's right. And what you're talking about there is the first of two great organizing principles. When it comes to emotions, there are two organizing principles. One of them is that sensory information coming from our skin or eyes or ears um, is sent to the thalamus, this, this little egg-shaped structure right down in the center of our brain. And it transmits this sensory information in two directions. Mm -hmm. if, the, if it's intense enough, for example, um, um, if we have, uh, in Florida, we have a lot of these black racers, mm -hmm. these, um, they're harmless snakes, okay? And they tend to cluster around your house, they eat lizards and insects and things. And you frequently see them. Uh, there was one out the other day in our yard. It's a harmless snake. Right. But still, when you're walking up your sidewalk and this snake crosses your path, it produces this emotional response. I'm not sitting there thinking about it, but, it's, but the, the instant I see it, I can feel myself get goosebumps and I go on alert, my heart rate increases. In a few milliseconds, I realize, oh, that's a black racer, no problem, okay? so. So when we get sensory information, it can be sent to these automatic right. responders and it tells me to get, get away. Okay, that's, that's one thing it can do. Um, and I react at a very unconscious level. So let's say I walk into a room and suddenly I'm aware that there's something headed toward my face, that somebody has thrown something. And before I do anything, I duck to get out of the way, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Only later do I realize it's a ball of paper or a Nerf ball or a marshmallow, okay? But that comes later. My first task is to get out of the way. I want to know if somebody's throwing things at your, at your head when you're walking out of the wing. Well, no, that's walking gonna, into a room. That's going to have to, that's gonna have to be a story for another time because I, I want to know about this story. Well, yeah, you walk into a room, somebody throws something at you and you duck, right? Okay. Now, but most of the time, I don't see a snake on my sidewalk. Most of the time, there aren't projectiles coming to, toward my head. Most of the time, we're not reacting to life-threatening sensory information. Right. In most cases, the thalamus says, hey, here's some stuff. I'm gonna send it to parts of your brain. Right. Do what you wanna do with it, okay? So now I enter a room and I see somebody, I see a close friend, okay? And so that, sensory information rather than startling me or scaring me. Okay. Um, I, my brain, my cortex, the thinking part of my brain recognizes, I, I recognize this as somebody I know. Um, I, uh, it's a friend, it's somebody I know intimately. I can recall the person's name, like, so it mm -hmm. produces memories and it directs my body to give her a hug or to shake her hand or make physical contact. Mm -hmm. So this sequence of events is not automatic, like mm -hmm. moving away from, from the Nerf ball. It's a conscious process that ends up with purposeful voluntary action. And that's what most of us are doing most of the time, is we're dealing with this second 
emotional system. Right. Okay. That too, we're usually dealing with the second one. Okay. Right. Yeah, the, the, the first one is, um, is sort of evolutionarily speaking, it's a, it's a survival response. That's right. Um, it, 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 is the, it is in many ways the basis of, of conditions like panic attacks and panic disorders, mm -hmm. um, phobias. Um, but you know, the, the, the treatment and experience of that is very different than mm -hmm. what we're talking about here as we're just talking about sort of the, the natural experience of emotions and feelings and things. Um, so yeah, that's a discussion for a different time when, when we're right. talking about anxiety disorders or panic disorders or something. Right. But when we talk about an emotional experience, when, when we talk about it clinically, we're talking about the, both of these things are happening, okay? They're, they're always both happening. Um, the, the information about my, my good friend is also sent to those automatic functions, but they don't have to do anything because they're not producing that intense emotional response, that, the, the, the um, life-threatening response, okay? Both things are happening, but, and what happens with, with us is that emotions are produced and if we can't direct them adequately, we start to have emotional problems. Right. Okay. And that's the beginning because they're both being produced, but we have to manage the emotions. And we learn that over time, just as we learn how to walk, we learn how to talk, we learn how to use language, you learn how to read. We also have to learn about our emotions. So, so let's go back now. What are these emotions? What is produced? Because most of the time we're doing that second kind of emotion where it's a thoughtful process. Okay. And that, that's not an easy question to answer either. How, how many emotions do we have? You know, it's, there's a lot of uh, um, discussion and there's a lot of different theorists who, who present this in very different ways. Right. Um, we know that they're cultural, they're, they're um, universal. Everyone experiences emotions, of course, every, every human, mo many animals um, experience emotions, um, but uh, discernible emotions um, that we can differentiate. But, um, but you know, there, there isn't really clear consensus on what that looks like either. Right. Yeah, there's somewhere between six and 350 emotions. Yeah. It depends who, you, right? Narrow it down to, but it began back in the, well, in the 1950s, a guy by the name of Paul Ekman right. began to research emotions. He did it as a doctoral student and, um, and, and continued to develop his theory over time. He, he identified six emotions, six basic fundamental emotions, okay? And as you might imagine, it's excitement, tender, scared, angry, sad, and happy, okay? Now, over time, he continued, he, he added more to that. Um, and um, he also did a study of what are the facial expressions that signify the emotion, right? Okay? And it was curious because um, Charles Darwin said the same thing uh, in 1872. Uh, people don't realize that when he went on this uh, trip on the Beagle, uh, where he developed his theory of evolution, or I should say refined his theory of evolution, he also did a second study on, um, on emotion, emotional expression. And as they encountered these different cultures, he would uh, study the facial expressions of the different cultures. And he discovered that all cultures smile when we're happy, right. okay? And so, and when he came back, he wrote a second book called The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals. And he said they're universal. Every culture, no matter what, they smile. And Ekman went um, into a um, island culture, a, an isolated um, culture that had no co contact with the outside world, did a similar study in, in, the, in the 1980s um, and found the same thing, that yes, indeed, all cultures uh, smile when we're happy and all cultures frown when we're sad. So there's a universality about emotions. We, we all experience the same ones. And so Ekman later added two more and ended up with eight emotions. I think he added um, interest and surprise right. to, the, uh, to the, the original six. Right. In 2017, there was another study done uh, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and they identified 27. Right. Emotional categories, okay. And that leads us to the Pluchek. Is that pronounced right, Pluchek? I don't know. He teaches at USF. 
Yeah. Yeah, he's a faculty member, or was a faculty member at USF. Yeah. And he developed the famous Pluchek wheel. Mm -hmm. And he has, uh, the way he structured it was um, two dichotomies. For example, at one end you have sadness, and the other you have joy. One end you have anger, the other fear. Expectations right. and surprise. And he yeah. took these um, eight basic emotions and developed what looked like a color wheel right. and expanded it into over 300 emotions. Right. Okay? And so there are nuances here and there are combinations and there are gradients that we could expand this on and on and on and on and on. Right. But we begin with a basic set of either six or eight emotions okay, that, right. that everybody experiences. Right. And, and if you've seen the movie um, uh, Inside Out, Inside Out, right? You know, we, we, we reviewed that movie uh, again back in 2017. Um, was that 2017? Oh, that's probably, what, that's probably why we were discussing emotions. It was, and it was June of 2017. <laughs> and, um, it, and in that movie, you know, it, it has these primary um, emotions. So there's joy, mm -hmm. sadness, and anger, and fear, and disgust, I think are the five right. presented in the movie. Um, and you know, but the idea that <clears throat> you combine these um, mm -hmm. the, 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 these basic emotions to create a, 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 a lot, a slew. Of, Do you remember how many characters were in that movie? I think it's five. For, for one for each of the emotions. One for each of the emotions. Right, yeah. and they had five characters. Right. right. And, 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 you know, and it presents it, one of the beautiful things about that movie, and, and there was a psychologist that, um, that collaborated with them on this, but one of the beautiful things about the movie is, you know, we tend to think of emotions as good emotions and bad emotions. You know, even when we look at this, this wheel, um, it's, you know, sadness on one end, joy at the other end, as though they are, you know, because we tend to think of them as mutually exclusive. You can't be sad right. and happy at the same time. But you can be, you know, when your kids go away to college for the first time, you're excited right. for them, you're happy for them, but you're also sad that they're leaving. And so, right. you know, you can be, you can have two emotions at the same time. And it's, um, it, it's a matter of, you know, as we'll get into it, you know, what do we label those emotions when they, when they come into these different combinations? And you, you make another really important point. There's no value, there's no better or worse emotions right there's no value to an emotion and this is one of the things that we want people to understand there it's not better to be sad than happy okay right. they are just two emotions they both have value they both are sending a message to you right. and they both need to be understood so don't think in terms of i can never be sad i must be happy all the time no you're going to have emotional experiences and right. each of those emotional experiences is important and, and must be attended to, okay? Absolutely. And so when we talk about emotions, um, why do we even have emotions? Well, it is our emotions that focus our attention and motivates, motivate us to action, right? It's our feelings, I'm feeling hungry, and that feeling of hunger motivates me to get something to eat. Right. I'm feeling thirsty. The feeling of fe feeling thirsty motivates me to get up and get something to drink. Right. Okay? And so our emotions, our feelings are what motivate us to action. So, so we like to think that don't ignore any of these emotions right. because they're trying to tell you something. And don't, um, you know, as we talk about this, we're going to emphasize the importance of not, um, not trying to avoid or minimize or just exactly. ignore any emotions. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I was talking to a, an elementary school kid the other week, and we were talking about emotions. And, um, you know, he, like most kids, you know, he was saying, well, there's good emotions and bad emotions. And, you know, I was trying to help him understand that all emotions are important and, and we want and need them at different times. And, and one of the things that was just, it was cute and funny to see is that, you know, I told him that 
his mom was sort of sitting there because we were on Zoom and um, or on teletherapy. And I said, um, I said, hey, buddy, believe it or not, one day you're going to choose to watch a movie because it makes you sad. Like right. you'll, you'll want to feel sad. And so you're going to watch a movie that you know makes you mm -hmm. feel sad. And he looked at me like I had two heads. And I said, well, I said, I said, I bet your mom does it. Ask her. And she goes, and she's sitting there. She goes, it's true. It's true. <laughs> and she, she gave him examples of movies that she watches that she cries um, about, you know, when she's watching it every time. And, right. and he's just, I just never, I never even thought of that. I never realized that. So yeah, right. all of these emotions are important <clears throat> and they all have messages to give us if we listen and we attend to those meanings and those right. yeah and so keep in mind that when it comes to emotions there are two pathways one is this very direct quick a uh, life-saving pathway it's instinctive it's reactive um you hear a loud bang and you move you you duck for cover okay um, but there's this other slower cognitive more thoughtful processing and what what it does it says i'm i'm feeling something Right. Um, I have this feeling from somewhere, somewhere, it's coming from some place. So what is this feeling and what should I do about it? And so the first goal is to know that you're feeling something, to, to have this sensation. The second, though, is to know what you're feeling and to identify it accurately. Right. And that becomes a greater challenge. And the example I use is with it happened with my own children and it happens with students as well. When a child, whether it's your child or a student or, or a coworker, when somebody says something that's disrespectful, that, that you interpret as being disrespectful, makes a side comment, calls your name, um, speaks to you in a, in a derogatory way. When my kids would do that, when they would give you that sigh of disgust, you know, it's time to clean your, oh God, you know, that sort of thing. And at first you feel angry and, that, and I would say, and it would make me angry. And you react angrily and then you regret it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Every time, and every parent says that, every time I get angry, I regret it. Right. What are you really feeling? Is it really, and, and so as I analyze that, I said, well, it's really not anger. I'm more hurt right. than angry. And when I, identified the emotion as hurt and I, I got rid of the anger and I said no this isn't really anger this my daughter just hurt my feelings okay then I was able to take step three which is to act accordingly right. so when I reacted as though I was hurt it was a completely different reaction than you made me angry and I have to get retribution now right yeah we, we fall into that that um that pit where we, if we react too quickly, if we act too impulsively, mm -hmm. we, we go with one of the, you know, maybe we can think of it as, uh, you know, one of the basic. Emotions. We go to one of those six or eight basic emotions. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, when, when in reality, it, it's much more complex. I mean, you know, should, <laughs> you know, what do you really expect when you ask your kids to go mow the yard? <laughs> you expect right. them to like jump up and down and be excited that right. they can go out and move. That's not gonna happen. Honey, I want you to stop playing your video game and go out in 95 degree heat and mow the lawn. Right. Why, why would we expect them to like jump up eagerly and, you know, put on their clothes to go out and do that? Um, I don't, the, probably the reason that I'm asking my kid to go do that is because I don't want to do it myself. You know, if I enjoyed mowing the yard, I would go out and mow it myself. So, you know, I'm just as reluctant and opposed to doing it as my kid is okay. if they huff when you ask them to do it, it it's not um you know school is surprise school is almost over and so parents are still saying honey you gotta stop playing your video game go do your homework or you gotta stop playing your video game you gotta go to bed because you have to get up in the morning right. of course they're gonna huff and puff you know they're gonna say yes that's a great idea right. you know, most kids are gonna say oh god oh, mom you know right um so, so you, you, you have to be careful that you don't react on one of the six or eight basic emotions, right. but instead go to the color wheel, go to the 300 emotions and say, what am I really feeling here? 
What, right. what is really being produced? Because it's only when you identify the emotion accurately that you're going to get an appropriate response, right. whether it's verbal or physical. Right. Absolutely. Because, you know, it could be it, it could be anger that you're feeling, but it could also be, as you said, it could be, you know, that your feelings are hurt or right. it, it could be that um, it could be exasperation because it's like, oh, I know it's, it's really hot outside. I don't want to go mow it either. But right. you know, so you could almost be commiserating with your kid, um, but you're not allowing yourself to really experience that and express that because mm -hmm. you're if you're if you're impulsively reacting, you know, you're just going to react with that, you know, that basic um, probably anger or frustration. That's right. So um, so we we encourage people to give emotions their due. They're, they're there for a reason. OK, and it's not good or bad give them their due. And the mistakes we make are for them. One is you act too soon. <clears throat> and so, um, oh, you made me angry. It really, so, so be careful of, of reacting too quickly and too impulsively. The second mistake we make is we ignore our emotions. Right. Okay? And we, we kind of push them away and we keep pushing them away. Remember that it, emotions are a knock at the door right. and you keep ignoring the knock. And you're going to do that at your own peril. There's a reason for the emotion, right. and you have to attend to it. Um, the third mistake is we repress our emotions. We acknowledge that it's there. I'm feeling sad today, but I'm going to push it down and, right. and not deal with it. Okay. And the other is uh, I have it, but I don't know what it is, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time worrying about it. And so we do an incomplete analysis, and we end up misidentifying the emotion. Okay. Right. There's four, four mistakes we can make. And the consequences of those mistakes, there are two. One is we can invite some mental health problems. Right. That's how we get that, that's a recipe for depression. That's right. You're going to get depression. You're going to get anxiety. You know, I have this, this very odd, this very bad feeling, this feeling of doom and gloom. Something bad's going to happen. Yeah, if you don't deal with it, it's going to continue to knock at the door. It's going to continue to nag you. It's like having a hair caught in your shirt. You know, it's going to continue to irritate you and, and you're going to become anxious. You're going to become depressed. Okay. You right. can't repress these feelings. Freud talked about that. I mean, right. he was the, talked eloquently about repressed, repressed feelings. Right. If you're feeling something, feel it. Um, people who are grieving, you know, they say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be sad. I don't want to be, no, it's not a question of wanting to be sad. You are sad. And I use the example of, of uh, surfing get on the wave and ride it. it the sadness is going to go away eventually but you have to ride it out if you fight it right you're going to you're going to invite problems right and, and it's and you know in, in situations like that what we have to remind ourselves is that um and this leads to the second potential mistake and, and that's that we miss opportunities um you, you should be sad you know, if, if, you, if you're grieving someone, the, the loss of someone or someone right. moved away or, you know, you, you're losing a relationship or, you know, you lost your job or something like that, that's a loss. And, and you should grieve and be sad at some, you know, at some level uh, right. about that loss. And uh, you have to allow yourself to experience it because it's through those experiences that we really learn more about who we are um what we respond to what we can handle what we can't handle um mm -hmm. and the more that we learn about ourselves the better we're going to be able to adapt and function you know with future events that's right you lose a loved one somebody really really close to you family member close friend and you you re-experience sadness right. you re-experience the loss so it's sadness over and over and over again if you ignore the sadness um no if you listen to the sadness, mm -hmm. you learn, you're right, you learn about yourself. You know, um, a, a dear friend of yours dies and you're sad. And a month later, you're sad again. What are you sad about? You're sad, first of all, because that person meant something to you. You know, what is it about that person that yeah. she meant so much to you? What values did she have that you, that you valued? Okay? Right. The other thing is, what do you what do you appreciate about that person? Because in identifying what you appreciate and miss about that person, you learn something about yourself. Right. You know, I learned that uh, it's important to me 
I, what I really liked about her was being honest. She was so forthright. She was so honest. And so, wow, oh, that's important to me. So that must be important to me. So the sadness informs us, okay? The right. anger informs us, the sadness, the happiness, the joy. So there is no good or bad emotion. Every emotion must be thought about and acted upon right. um, for its own. Okay, and that there's nothing wrong with being sad. Right. Sad is a way to inform yourself um, about your value system. Right. So okay. what's what's the critical challenge really for for all of us? You know, and we all have it, whether we're adults or we have we're kids. You know, we the challenge really is that you know the first challenge is that we have to be able to identify our emotions accurately. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's pausing for a moment and, and really contemplating and thinking about what is what you're experiencing, you know, um, and, and asking yourself, why? Why am I feeling this? Why, why am I so stressed and so frustrated right now, you know, because of what's happening in, in the house right now? Right. And then you can start putting pieces together so that mm -hmm. you can actually act on it in, in, in an appropriate way. Right. That's right. And that that's what we want adults to do. We want, we ask adults, identify your feelings accurately. You know, please take time, pause, um, identify them accurately, make sure you know, make sure you're convinced that you're, you're certain that this is what I'm really feeling, okay? Okay, and the second thing is you have to listen to your emotions. If it is anger, you don't have to react immediately. You can say, okay, what is it about this that's making me so angry? What am I dealing with here, okay? And then the third thing is to act on that um, information in a socially appropriate way. Right. Uh, in other words, you just can't lash out and hit somebody. Um, you can't start screaming and swearing at, a, at another person. So you have to act in a socially appropriate way. And if you've done the first two steps, identify the emotion accurately, and listen to it and, and use it, um, you're probably going to get a more appropriate response. It's when we, it's when we get that hair trigger response, that impulsive response, right. that we get into trouble. Absolutely, and and you know, and it's it's going to be tough for some of you adults listening to this. Mm -hmm. It's going to be tough because you perhaps you've never done that before, um, and you know, for that reason, it's it's really important that we start with kids. We start young, you know. Right. Kids birth, you know, from birth to three, they, they are experiencing emotions. They do, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they don't know what they are. They don't know how to, they, they don't have words for them or anything like that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, they experience emotions, uh, you know, all the way up until they start, they're starting kindergarten, certainly. They, they experience everything just about that we do. That's um, right. They just don't know how to label it and how to identify it. That's right. Even empathy, you know, a, a two-year-old, mm -hmm. um, if he sees his mother crying, um, knows that something is wrong and, and they'll, they'll try to comfort their mother. Uh, two and three year olds do that. And so they have the experience of emotions. They don't have the vocabulary yet, okay? They can't tell you what they're feeling, but that's a developmental skill that they have to learn. Um, again, uh, up to about age five or six, kids don't have the vocabulary to identify emotions accurately. But as they mature mm -hmm. through childhood and adolescence, teenagers begin to develop a vocabulary right. um, to explain their emotions. Not fully developed, but right. it's developing. So it's not that kids don't feel the emotions. They don't have the vocabulary to um, identify those emotions. And that's where parents and teachers uh, come in, is that we, we have to help children identify their emotions, know that their emotions are okay, but to respond to them in a socially appropriate manner. Right, and, and, and we help them build the vocabulary and the appropriate responses by, by exposing our kids to those, to mm. the vocabulary. You know, right. it, it, it doesn't sound, you know, if they, your kid says, I'm, I'm so mad, okay, you know, let's talk about it. What does it feel like? Oh, well, that mm. doesn't sound like mad. That sounds more like overwhelmed. That right. sounds more like frustrated. That sounds exactly. more like um, that you're pretty stressed out. And, you know, let's talk about 
some other terminology, some other ways to express the difference between what you're feeling right now versus right. what it feels like when somebody, you know, makes you turn off your video games. You know, right. they're, they're two different things, but you're saying it's the same thing, but it sounds like they're two very different things. Right. And kids have to have, they have to be allowed to have emotions. Right. Um, I've been in family, I've, I've seen other families where um, children are discouraged from expressing any, um, a, a full range of emotions, okay? Um, you, you know, what do you mean you're sad? What do, what do you mean you're sad? You know, you're, you know. And you you turn, 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 I'm sorry? What do you have yeah. to be sad about? What do you have to be sad about? You know, what, what's, what, what's wrong with you? You know, you're only 14. What do you have to be sad about? Um, and so parents must allow their children, they, children must have permission to experience a range of emotions because that's how they get from six basic emotions to the emotional wheel of 340, is that they're allowed to experience them. This, this one of the saddest things that I witness in families is that kids aren't, are, are only allowed to express um, happiness and anger. It's okay to be happy and it's okay to be angry. You know, we, 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 we acknowledge that you sometimes get angry. Well, my goodness, there's, a, there's an array um, uh, of emotions between happy and anger that kids need to learn that they have. They're allowed to have them because, and they have to learn how to identify them accurately so that they react appropriately. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in anger and in happy, that's just one of the, uh, of the opposing poles. Um, there, there's, you know, three others. Um, right. There's so many more, right? Yeah. There's so many more. They're nuanced. It's like taste and flavor. You know, we have, you know, four basic tastes, but we have hundreds of flavors. Right. And, and it's the same thing with emotions. We have six or eight basic emotions, but there are hundreds of nuances right. that we have to acknowledge. And kids need to learn. They have to, it's like adults. You're allowed to be sad. You're allowed to be angry. You're allowed to be despondent. You're allowed to feel despair. Those are all okay. Right. It's, but now you have to learn to identify accurately and to act appropriately. Absolutely. So as I said at the beginning of the podcast, I, um, I'm working to, to try to get all of the, you know, a, a variety of links uh, mm -hmm. posted in the show notes so that you can learn more about whether it's the color wheel or it's, you know, some strategies for, for how to deal with emotions. Um, I'm working to get those um, as functional links in the, in the show notes. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, if not, I'll just put the URLs in there and you can, you'll have them that way. So. Um, but I think that's, I think that's it for today. Welcome to May. Yes, we're here. May. The year is flying, one more year flying by. Yes, it is. It's approaching the halfway point, as unbelievable as that is. That's, Absolutely. So. It's crazy. So. Have a good May. Absolutely. Definitely have a good May. So, all right, mm -hmm. that's it for today. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid.